It's great, to, it's great to see you here this morning, and also those of you that uh, are watching online or listening to podcasts uh, later on, um, thanks for coming. Uh, kind of a weird thing happened to me uh, just the day before yesterday. I was down here at like around noon unlocking the door down at this corner of the church when this guy walks up behind me. Um, long hair, a beard. I turned around and he said, follow me. And I said, uh, where? He didn't answer, kind of like he didn't know, he didn't know the way. He looked like he had been camping, and, and he said it again, follow me. And uh, trying to get rid of him, I said, well, look, I, I, don't, I don't know where you're going. I don't have a backpack. I don't have a sleeping bag. I don't even have a I don't even have, uh, uh, I don't even have a, a, a toothbrush. And he says something about foxes have holes, birds have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, follow me. And I said, get real. And he said, I am. Follow me. And I said, look, I just got frustrated with the guy, I held up my executive planner, you know, and I said, look at this. Just look at this. I'm, I'm a busy pastor. I mean, my life is really, this week has been like a, excuse me, a shit storm, and I have a funeral to do in like two hours. He looks me in the eye and he says, leave the dead to bury their own dead and come follow me. Can you believe that? I mean, that's so rude. I just looked back at him and I said, no, 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 no. And the look on his face was like I broke his heart, and he just kind of like turned around and walked away. It was the weirdest thing. There were these like 12 guys following him. Didn't really happen. And yet away it did, and, and it does. So pray with me. Lord God, we ask that you would help us to know the way. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would cause us to preach, to follow you, the resurrection and the life, wherever you go. In your name that we pray, amen. C.S. Lewis wrote this. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions in one's own or real life. The truth, of course, is that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life. The life God is sending one day by day. What one calls one's real life is a phantom of one's own imagination. It's a fascinating idea, you see, that God is sending you your life every day. And that if you make an idol of your own executive planner, your vision, your strategy, and goals, you might miss God's vision, God's strategy, and God's goals, which is your life. And yet, if, if you say yes to everyone that interrupts you, you make an idol out of everyone else's executive planner. Not every hippie that tells you to do something is speaking the word of God. I actually did have a funeral to do on Friday. Came rather suddenly. And I couldn't do it the, the following week. And I really, really wanted to do it. But I didn't know I had fit it into my schedule. So I said, let me check on some things and I'll call you back. I prayed with Susan, who's always reminding me to say, no, we prayed. And she said, Peter, I, I see Jesus. And he has a bag. And he just hands it to you. I, I think you're supposed to do all these things. And then with her, I just shared my anxiety. I shared my anxiety, my stress with Jesus. And she said, I just heard him say, Peter, don't run, walk. And I said, what he meant? This is not an interruption. This is the week that I have prepared for you. And it's, it's all in the bag. And so you, you know how to walk. Last week we looked at Acts 16. The Lord gives Paul a vision of a man calling for help in Macedonia, which is Europe, and the heart of the ancient 
empire of Alexander Great and, and the Greeks. And so Paul formulates a strategy and a plan, which isn't bad. It's good. And yet he's interrupted by a slave girl possessed by a spirit and then interrupted by a mob and a beating with rods and imprisonment in the inner prison and then he's interrupted by an earth storm, an earthquake. That's all in God's plan. And that's how the gospel conquered Europe. And you, you look mostly like Europeans. God gives him the vision but doesn't tell him how it will happen or anything about the storm that's coming. But he does tell him how to walk. In Acts 23, the Lord gives Paul another vision about bringing the gospel to the heart of the Roman Empire. Paul will testify in, in Rome. In Acts 22, the chapter just before he tells him this, Paul has finished his second missionary journey and he's returned to Jerusalem, remember, with an offering uh, from the Gentiles for the poor in Jerusalem, Jews. James and the other disciples, they warn Paul not only about the Jewish Jews, but all the Christian Jews that are zealous for the law, and they've been told that Paul tells Jews not to live by the law. In Jerusalem, some Jews from Ephesus, they spot him, they accuse him of taking a Gentile into the temple. A riot starts. The mob tries to kill Paul in, in the temple, but he's rescued by Roman soldiers who, who literally carry him out of the temple as they are arresting him for inciting a, a riot. He begs them to let him speak, and, then he, and, and, and they do, and, and he does. Paul shares his testimony. He just bears witness to what he has seen and heard as God told him to do, and as I think he tells us to do, you don't have to create anything, you just bear testimony. The crowd listens to the good news until he shares that the Lord has told them to take this good news to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and at that, the riot starts once again. The Roman tribune threatens to flog Paul, locks him in the barracks, but then he arranges for this meeting between the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, uh, with Paul there because the tribune just doesn't understand why the Jews are so angry about this gospel, this good news. By the end of the meeting, he still doesn't understand, and that's a huge theme towards the end of the book of Acts. Why do religious people hate the gospel? There's good news. Acts 23.10, and when the dissension in the Sanhedrin became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, Tharse. Take courage, take heart, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified to the facts about me, more literally, as you testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must, dei in Greek, it is necessary, it is bound, you must testify also in Rome. It's interesting that where Paul will go and what will happen when he gets there is all in the indicative tense. Um, literally, it is bound to happen. It has been bound to happen. But how he will travel is in the imperative tense. And, and this is then Christ's command. Tharse, take courage, take heart, have tharsos, courage, have good cheer. The verb... This verb only shows up in a few places in Scripture. You know, when the disciples are caught in a storm on the Sea of Galilee during the fourth watch of the night, uh, when fearing for their lives, they see this figure walking on the water, and they're convinced that a go it's a ghost, and so they, they cry out in terror, and Jesus immediately answers them, Tharse. In the plural, Tharsete. You, you all take heart. It's me. Or more literally, Facete, I am. Fear not. And when the disciples are caught in a far more terrifying storm that we've come to call Good Friday, just after dinner and before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says this, Facete, you'll take heart. In the world you will have tribulation, but Facete, be of good cheer. I have overcome the cosmos, the world. I have overcome most of the world. No, he doesn't say that. I have overcome 
some of the world. He doesn't say that. I overcome the world except for all those people endlessly stuck in hell. No, doesn't say that. I've overcome the world as long as you do your part. Hell no, he definitely does not say that. I have overcome the world. It has happened. Even before Easter. He's talking before Easter. And now the command. This is the command. Tharsete. Take courage. Be of good cheer. Jesus tell Paul, tells Paul what will happen. You will testify in Rome. Kind of like he told Abram, I will bless you. And in you, all the nations, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It will happen. Jesus tells Paul what will happen. If I'm Paul at this point, I'm thinking, awesome. Caesar is going to hear about me. And they're basically going to send a yacht to pick me up and take me to Rome to be his personal guru. And when that doesn't happen, I'm thinking, okay, I need to pull out my executive planner. Come up with a strategy and make a plan. And if it didn't happen according to my plan, I would have anti-Thesaro. Tharseo. I'd have despair, depression, disappointment, and shame because I would conclude that I had messed up God's plan with my plan. But Jesus said, Tharseo, you must testify. It is literally bound to happen. And yet he doesn't mention what happens next. A little like he didn't mention to Abraham what would happen next. 4,000 years at least of sin, exile, crucifixion, world wars, and the crazy week that you had last week when you didn't feel blessed. He doesn't mention what Paul will be, that, that Paul will be imprisoned in Caesarea. He says, you will testify in Rome. Doesn't mention they'll be imprisoned in Caesarea, just 50 miles from Jerusalem, for the next two years. That's quite an interruption. And yet while he's there, as we discover in Acts 24, He'll testify the Roman governor Felix, become something of his counselor, and possibly write some of the Bible, and all of that requires tharsos, confidence, courage, good cheer. In Acts 25, the Roman governorship passes to Porcius Festus. The Jews plot to kill Paul once again, and Paul appeals to Caesar, which was his prerogative as a Roman citizen. Meanwhile, Festus asked King Herod Agrippa to help him examine Paul because he can't figure out why the religious folks hate him so much. He feels foolish sending him to the emperor and not being able to tell him why. Some archaeologists suggest that this is actually where Paul stood in the theater at Caesarea where King Herod the Roman governors, military tribunes, the prominent men of the city. If you look in that picture, you'll even see Jolene Miller. And they all gather to hear Paul testify, which requires tharsos, confidence, good cheer, courage. Jesus said, you will testify in Rome and take courage. But he didn't mention two and a half years of imprisonment in Caesarea, and he didn't mention what was about to happen next. And I suppose that's good, for otherwise we would not know about Tharsos. And Jesus would not have said, Tharsete, y'all have courage. And we would never learn how to walk on water or hell. You know, in the Jewish mind, in Hebrew thought, the depths of the sea is death and hell. Jesus walked on it. And so did Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. The way. The way is how it is walked, wrote Soren Kierkegaard. The going is the path, wrote C.S. Lewis. Trust in the Lord and he will make straight your path, wrote Solomon. Trust and God will move heaven and earth under your feet. Maybe even the sea. Make it solid. In Acts 26, King Herod and Governor Porcius Festus and this is funny, I looked this up. Porcius, you know what that means? It actually means porky. Porcius Festus, the governor, declare after interviewing Paul, this man could be set free. But he has appealed to Caesar. 
And so they put Paul in the custody of a centurion named Julius, and Luke, Paul, Julius, Paul, and, and other prisoners, they set sail on the sea along the coast of Asia Minor. In Myra, they board this uh, large ship from Alexandria, Egypt, bound for Rome, apparently hauling grain. With much difficulty, the Bible says, they all find themselves sailing under the lee of Crete. Sounds like an interesting place, Crete. Acts 27, verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. That's talking about the Day of Atonement, so it's like September or October. Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owners of the ship than to what Paul said. They don't listen to Paul. And why should they listen to Paul? And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing they had obtained their purpose, prothesis, their plan, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous tempestuous wind, Typhonicos animos, angry typhoon, one hell of a storm, an interruption, called the northeaster, struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. God's judgment's like that. If you fight it, it will destroy you. But if you're driven by it, like a feather in a tornado, who knows where you might end up? Verse 16, running under the lee of a small island called Kata, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat, the the lifeboat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship, probably with cables or something. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, these sandbars in North Africa, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. In Scripture, God arranges storms to destroy our plans. And that's his plan. It was a violent storm that thwarted Jonah as he ran from the will of the Lord. God arranges for storms to destroy our plans and reveal his plan, Jesus. Remember in the Gospels, the disciples think that they're about to die in a storm on the sea, and then they find Jesus asleep in the boat. When they wake him, he rebukes the storm as if it were inhabited with demons. Indeed, it's as if evil reacted to his presence upon the sea. He rebukes the storm, and it stops. And then he bemoans his disciples' lack of faith, lack of tharsos for Even if the sea is Hades and the storm is demons, all creation belongs to our dad, who is relentless love and all-powerful. And then, of course, one day Jesus comes walking to them in the middle of the night in a storm on the sea, and for a moment, Peter walks on the raging sea as well. Well, God uses storms. He uses interruptions to destroy our plans and reveal his plan, Jesus and even make us his plan, the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 10 and 11, God set forth, protithemi is the verb, to propose, to, God proposed a plan, to propose a plan. God proposed a plan, set forth his will in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite anakephaliao, literally bring together under one head, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose, the prothesis of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Religious types will tell you that you cannot believe that text. But Paul wrote that text and several other texts just like it, and I think it gave him incredible tharsos so that he could tharseo, walk through any storm with a smile on his face. 
Verse 20, when all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned, since they had been without food for a long time, and keep in mind that they're literally standing on a boatload of grain, they're not eating out of fear rather than lack of provision. Sound familiar? Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and occurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart. Jesus told Paul to take heart. And now Paul is telling these Gentile soldiers and Greeks and sailors and prisoners to take heart. Euthymo, synonym of tharseo, meaning take heart, rejoice. Take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must, dei, it is necessary, it is bound. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, euthemio. Men, uh, take heart, men, euthemio. Take heart, for I have faith, says Paul, in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must, it is necessary, run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the soldiers, uh, as the sailors, that is, were seeking to escape from the ship, and had lowered the ship's boat, the lifeboat, into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, y'all cannot be saved. Paul didn't say, unless these men stay in the ship, they cannot be saved. He said, unless these men stay in the ship, y'all cannot be saved. He talks as if one's salvation is dependent on another's salvation. When we often talk as if one's salvation is dependent on another's damnation. In Scripture, ships on seas are often seen as metaphors for the church, but the church is not wooden nails. The church is made of people. I watched a documentary on fire ants the other night in a flood. The ants actually hold on to each other. Have you seen this? And they make a raft. They make a ship out of their bodies connected one to another. In the same way, God makes one body out of us and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, the body of Christ. So our church, the wood and the nails, can get smashed on the rocks. But the true church is the body of Christ. And Christ is not simply temporal, Christ is eternal. And according to Paul, in the end, and Christ is the end, all things, or at least all people created in Adam, come together in one body, which is Christ's body, and a kephali, uh-oh. It doesn't mean that some won't sink into the abyss, or weep and gnash their teeth in outer darkness for a time, and it doesn't mean that some won't be reduced to dust first by the eternal fire, it does mean because God animates and can reanimate dust with just a breath, and because Jesus himself descended into Hades, and because all things are possible for God, God still will accomplish his prothesis. The seventh day, all things new, everything good and it is finished, will happen. And so everyone that's anyone is ultimately your body. Christ's body. You're not in competition with them. Heaven is actually communion with them. So if you think you can enjoy heaven while your brothers and sisters endlessly suffer in hell, you just got no idea what heaven actually is. And oh yeah, of course you don't tharseo, take courage. Well, because hell might happen to you. You might be one of them, and the measure you give is the measure you get. So if you cut them off from the body of Christ, you, well, I think you just cut yourself off from the body of Christ. Verse 31, unless these men stay in the ship, you all cannot be saved. Verse 32, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's lifeboat and let it go. Let the idea of their own private salvation go. 
As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food. And remember them all, them all are Paul's captors and the ancient enemies of his people, the, the Jews. Paul urged them all, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and given thanks, eucharisteo in Greek, giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. And some ancient manuscripts then add this, having given also to us. Then they all were encouraged, euthema, euthemios, took heart and ate some food themselves. They did what Paul told them to do. Why? Well, because the storm had exposed his heart, his tharsos. And not only his heart, but the heart of God with him. They did what Paul told them to do. And what did he tell them to do? Verse 33. Take some food. What food? Verse 35. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat, having given also to us. Does that sound vaguely familiar? <laughs> Remember that Luke, who traveled with Paul, is writing Acts. So Luke had to have gotten a lot of his information from Paul. He's, he's writing Acts as the second half of the gospel according to Luke. This is Luke twenty two nineteen, 19. And he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Which reminds us of Luke chapter 9, verse 16. And taking the five loaves, he said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set them before the crowd. Kind of like Luke 24, 30, when he was at table with them, when Jesus was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Verse 35, then they told what had happened on the road. This is an Easter. They told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, Paul writes this, I received from the Lord what I also handed over to you, that on the night Jesus was handed over, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Hopefully you notice some similarities in all those passages. Every commentary that I read just can't help but point out that it seems as if Luke is implying that Paul gave communion to everyone on that ship. That idea is strengthened by the fact that some ancient manuscripts include the phrase, having given also to us, which implies that it was originally in the text and someone thought grace this free is just a bit much and so took it out. Or it was not originally in the text, and someone thought, well, surely this is what Luke meant. Whatever the case, it doesn't really matter. All the commentaries seem to point out how very much this sounds like some form of communion. But then they all go on to say, well, it's certainly, or at least the ones I read, well, it certainly couldn't actually have been communion, for that would mean that Paul would have been offering it to Gentiles. <laughs> that is, Non-Christians, according to our judgment. Uh, that is, folks that haven't joined the church because they haven't met our qualifications. Do you realize that in Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus commands the disciples at the table with him to take communion, imperative tense. Do this in remembrance of me. Two verses later, verse 21, Jesus says, The hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. You understand? Jesus clearly gives communion to Judas and Peter, knowing full well who they are and what they've done and will do. And yet most churches require classes, confessions, prior rituals, even covenants to be made before you receive the eternal covenant of grace. We seem to think that we must judge you and accept you before you can receive the judgment and the forgiveness of God, your Father. And yet, uh, 
When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, the one tangible, repeatable, corporeal thing he asks us to do, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, the, the institutional churches or group of churches, denominations, they, they often say, well, that's the one thing you, you cannot do. And we have fought bloody battles over hundreds and hundreds of years over who exactly can do it. And we've decided that it's someone who's been through three years of seminary, jumped through all our hoops, and has a certificate from us. He can serve communion. And Jesus just said, do it, to 12 uneducated, utterly bewildered disciples, including Judas. Was anybody on that boat a worse sinner than Judas? Actually, yes. The foremost of sinners, according to Scripture, St. Paul. So churches either forbid the free distribution of communion or they make an argument that communion really isn't communion. It's just a sign, you know, with no real substance, a sign pointing to a lofty ideal. So just to be clear, I believe in the real presence I know this is weird, but I've watched communion wine burn people like fire. I've seen communion bread literally hold a body to a wall like nails hold flesh to a cross. I know of a person in our body who held it in their hand one Christmas Eve and felt it beating in his fist and then heard it beating throughout all of creation. I know of a gal who couldn't swallow the bread at communion in our church until she said, Okay, Jesus, you can come in. Then she swallowed. I believe in the real presence, probably more than most. Now, some have been concerned that we feed it to our kids. One guy was, I got a long letter years ago from this one guy, really, really upset and concerned that I had wiped Jesus on my pants. I remember thinking, good God. We've crucified him and cannibalized him for years and years and years. I don't think he's worried about the children or my pants. I believe in the real presence, probably more than most. Jesus said, I am the life. Not a life, but the life. Doesn't that mean that any life is actually his life? I think that one day we will all be blown away, not by the fact that Jesus was in the communion bread, but by the fact that Jesus is in all bread, all food, all life that we have killed and consumed in order to grow ourselves. Well, not even stopping to say thanks. Eucharisteo. Everything is grace. And yet we only say thanks perhaps once in a great while or at church on Sunday. And I get why that's so important to professionals like me and the institutional church. We'd like you to think that we control grace. In Acts 24 through 27, the Romans just can't figure out why the religious folks are getting so infuriated about the gospel of grace. The proclamation of this Jesus. Jesus means God is salvation. And you say that you see the church is tempted to preach we are salvation. The church is tempted to keep God as salvation in a box and sell him for profit. Meanwhile, you are tempted to buy. But true religion is to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and keep oneself unstained from the world, the systems of this world, writes James. But most of what passes as religion in our world is really one group of people who think they control the grace which in a way they may for a time, but only to their own demise. One group arguing with another group, it leads them to think that their salvation is dependent on someone else's damnation. Someone else that doesn't belong to their group, their church. The Romans couldn't understand why the Jews hated Paul. And you see, I think it was because Paul preached salvation for all, even Romans. The Jews thought that their salvation was dependent on the Romans' damnation which was just inconceivable to the Romans, for they were convinced that their exaltation was obviously dependent on the humiliation of the Jews, and they were good at it. 
But neither could conceive of a God that could have grace on all, and that this grace could create faith in all, a good free will in all, that is love in all, that is a new heart in all. And that's because they had not yet seen the heart of God given to us for us to beat within us, given to us on the tree in the garden. And I think that's because there are some things that you just can't truly see except for in a storm where all your plans are stripped away. And all that's left is the plan of God, the judgment of God, the prothesis of God, the word of God, the heart of God from the bosom of the Father, Jesus. You know, when Jesus said, take and eat, take and drink, it was at just the right time at the very heart and the very height of the storm. And its meaning was revealed when he lifted his head on the tree and cried, Father, forgive them, them, Romans, Jews, Judas, us. And then he delivered up his spirit, the spirit that's in the blood that he had given us the night before at communion. The sun's light failed, the earth shook, the temple was open, the dead were raised. We meet Jesus, the heart of God, in the storm. 1 Corinthians 10, 28. Let a person examine himself. Not let a person exam be examined by church authorities with the knowledge of good and evil. Paul writes, let a person examine himself. And then, so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Without discerning the body. What body? The body of Christ. Paul was writing to people in Corinth who had come to communion. This is right, in the, right before this. They would, they would get drunk, feed themselves, and not feed their neighbor. Christ's body. And worse, they had divided into factions. In, in a body, that's called cancer. Cancer is a cell that saves itself by feeding on others rather than sacrificing itself that all might be saved. That all might live. Mises, the belief that I am my own salvation, and wheezes, the belief that my faction, my group is salvation. Mises and wheezes is a cancer on Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is judgment on Mises. It will burn away our flesh in order that we'd all be one flesh, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. See, Paul isn't protecting communion from sinful people. He's protecting sinful people from communion. He's saying if you drink grace when you're opposed to grace, it will cause quite a storm within your soul. You may remember Peter's agony just a little while after he drank the cup. And of course you remember the agony of Judas. The judgment of God can cause quite a storm, and yet if you surrender to it and don't oppose it, it will drive you. He will drive you all the way to salvation. Verse 35, and when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat, having given also to us. Then they all were encouraged. Euthemios took heart and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with, with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. That's the wood and the nails. That's the old Jerusalem. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or in pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land, literally thoroughly delivered to the land. And that's the birth of the church. The new Jerusalem coming down. The eternal body of Christ beginning to be manifest in space and time, wherein each loves all and all love each. No man hates his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, wrote Paul. 
Paul loved his neighbor as himself because he believed that ultimately his neighbor was himself. The body of Christ. I think he offered those folks communion on that sinking ship. And even if Luke didn't mean to imply communion, it still was communion. Paul gave them his broken self. And what poured out was tharsos, the courage that comes from Jesus, for it's the life of Jesus, is faith. In Romans, we saw the long argument Paul made that faith in us is Christ in us, the free will of God in us. The world is starving for faith in God, who is relentless love. But now this has become a really important question in our society. Who are you going to trust? A minister was making a wooden trellis to support a vine. As he was pounding away, he noticed this little boy just watching him. The boy didn't say a word, so the preacher thought that eventually he'd go away, but he, he did not. Rather pleased at the thought that his work was being admired, the pastor said, well, son, are you trying to pick up some pointers on gardening? The little boy said, nope. I'm just waiting to hear what a preacher says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> you see, that's a smart kid. Jesus is revealed in storms like that. A lot of people call themselves Christian for all sorts of reasons, but Christian means something like little Christ. And Christ in you is revealed by your courage in the storm. Y'all can't watch me hit my thumb with a hammer while I'm building a trellis, because it's just not practical has to be something you don't arrange. But maybe we could all build trellises together. That, that would help. And then God will arrange something. And maybe your neighbor can watch you hit your thumb with a hammer or take courage in some other storm, but that's how people actually come to believe. You know, I, th I think I believe because I watched my dad in some storms. And death is maybe the ultimate storm. I watched my dad as his ego died, got crucified, and Jesus showed up. And my heart knew that wasn't an act. That was real. That was real life. And I watched my dad as his body slowly died, and I saw Tharsos. I saw his courage, which is God's courage, Jesus and my dad. And I think I believe because I saw that courage in Maureen May when her husband Jim died. And I loved Jim, but Maureen loved him way more. I know it hurt like hell. But I've watched Maureen take courage and I've thought to myself, wow, she really believes. Maybe this Jesus thing is true. And I think I believe because I saw the same thing from her friend Kathy McWilliams just this last week. It was her husband, John, for whom I did the, the service. You see, I met Jesus in that storm. I saw Jesus, see Jesus, and Kathy. I think I believe because I see Jesus in Bill Fulton. Bill lost the love of his wife, Liz, a few years ago. One, one time he said to me, what do I do to be doing the works of God? He didn't use those words, but that's what he was asking and I said, Bill, I think you're doing it. Your love for God and for Frankie and the people in your life, that's not you. That's Christ in you. That's faith in you. I think I believe because I see you believe in the midst of storms, and I hope some of you see me believe because you've seen me believe in the midst of storms. There are all sorts of intellectual arguments, reasons to believe that I could make. But to really believe, which means to trust in God is salvation, you have to meet God is salvation in the storm. And to help others believe, you have to take courage in your own storms. And then bleed Jesus. Bleed grace. Bleed Tharsos. Like, like Paul. 
And don't worry, God will provide the storms. <laughs> In this world, you will have tribulation, said Jesus. But farsete, imperative tense. In other words, this is what I'm commanding you, what I'm asking of you now. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It's not only bound to happen. I'll be showing you that it has already happened. Jesus said that right after he took bread and having given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, broken for you, given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, drink of it. And he said, all of you, do it in remembrance of, of me. When the Empress of Ireland sank, which was just a, a few years after the Titanic sank, of the 1,477 people on board, 1,012 died. But many of those who lived told the same story. A man had run up to them on the deck of that sinking ship and strapped his own life jacket on them saying something like, please take this. I think I can die better than you. Of those that died that night, 109 were Salvation Army officers and none were found wearing a life jacket. I can die better than you. If that statement was arrogance, it's worthless. And it's a lie. But I imagine that statement was tharsos, which is the spirit of Jesus in you. And that's how the church changes the world. Dark cups are wine, blue cups are juice. Both are tharsos. Good cheer. Amen? How you love us. Well, gosh, it just kind of becomes fun to say to someone sitting next to me on a plane or on a bus that's sinking in the storm, thinking that you hate them. It's fun to be able to tell them, oh, he does like you a lot. He loves you more than you could possibly ever know. And even if you run from him, he'll chase you. He'll hunt you down and he'll bring you home. So why don't you just come home now? In Jesus' name. God is good. That's the good news. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. And in Jesus, you have revealed that fact. Your heart hanging on a tree in a garden. Amen. And so I'm just saying that you are a vessel. You're a vessel of immeasurable power, actually. You know, Jesus said that we can do whatever he did. And yet he also said, I only do what I see my father doing. So sometimes he walked on water and sometimes he suffered immensely uh, for the love of us. And so I'm also saying that, yeah, I think you are called to give communion to your neighbor. Even bread and wine, but most definitely faith, tharseo. That what spills out of you is, is courage and hope. And I hope you see that when you see our Father loves everyone the lo way he, he loves you, well, then it's a joy to share that message. This week's message is really a continuation of last week's message. So how does the church change the world? Number one, we worship in the darkest of all places and set the captives free. And number two, we serve communion, even to our enemies, on sinking ships. The sinking ship that is this world, that all might come safely to the land. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.